Uh, so I'm Chris Cooper from HP Enterprise Security. I run a consultancy practice that specialises in security consultancy and transformation. Uh, and today we're going to have a look at um, security, transfer, uh, security strategies and how they apply in the modern business. The security strategies have changed quite a lot over the last 10 years. Now, 10 years ago, it was an IT document. Uh, it would be sponsored by the IT director and your kind of biggest questions in it were, shall I use Semantic or shall I use McAfee? And do I actually need a firewall? Now, that kind of thing. And it's changed a lot. Now, now we're looking, it's a business level strategic document. It's sponsored by somebody on the board and it's a very critical document as to how things are going to progress. So we're going to take a look at a few areas today, which is the current challenges and trends, uh, the implications of the new style of IT, and just for a clarification, digital transformation is what's generally the market term. HP has coined the phrase new style of IT. So I'm going to use the term new style of IT because that's what I've been brainwashed to use, uh, and we'll take it from there. And then we'll use uh, look at security as a business enabler, and then finally, if we've got some time, we'll have a look at some questions. And the one question I do get asked a lot, as I'm going to cover it before I start, is what does HP know about security? They make printers. It's, uh, it's a <laughs> yeah. Now, just to make it absolutely clear, I'm just going to put HP security into context. I'm going to do it quickly because I'm not here to sell HP. Uh, but this is our customer-facing HP environment. So we have something like 5,000 security professionals globally now. Uh, we have nine security operation centers around the world, and we monitor about 23 billion security events a month. Um, so we have a pretty good idea what's going on around the world, uh, and we engage with pretty much every industry sector, from public sector to private companies across the globe. But we also have a big system of our own. Now, we've got something like 300,000 employees in HP. Um, and that means we have a pretty big infrastructure of our own to look after the security. Now we've got an e-commerce site uh, and we've got something like 41,000 servers around the globe currently uh, and about 73 petabytes of data. And you can see we generate within our own network two and a half billion security events per day that have to be monitored through the SOC. So now between our own internal environment and our external customer work, we do have a pretty good idea what's going on out there. And Hopefully you can trust us to tell you what we're talking about. So we're going to start by looking at the big picture. Uh, we'll look at the, uh, wait for this to draw itself. We're going to look at the enterprise imperatives, uh, both at the high level and then also some of the new trends that are coming in in terms of technology, which is what we call the mega trends. Now on the enterprise side, you've got three key things that are pushing this. You've got competition. Now the, the financial uh, market that we've gone through over the last few years has really forced competition to an extent that now you've seen lots of companies disappear. And regulation, now with the financial regulations with Basel III and all of those that have come through, we've seen a lot of extra regulation come in that all of these companies have to cope with. But at the same time, they have to be more flexible and they have to compete more and they have to do everything quicker and innovate. Uh, and the other problem is you and me. We want a whole new world of doing things. Now, we don't want to do everything on by in a shop anymore. We want to go online. We want to use our mobile devices. We want to use the cloud. And we're forcing companies to go in a whole new direction. Now, Amazon didn't come along, didn't create itself. We forced its creation. Now, we, it created initial environment that was a, a bookshop. And by the drive of a consumer, by you and me, we've driven it to be this massive enterprise because we want to buy everything on our mobile phone or on, on the web. And that's changed the way that every business has worked. At the same time, you've got the mega trends. Now, companies are collecting huge amounts of data. And if you just look at the security events we were talking about just now, now two and a half billion security events per day, we need a big data solution just to cope with the security events we're producing. Cloud, cloud uh, storage, cloud processing, now it's the, the buzzword for everything out there today and every company of, of any significant size is having to look at cloud solutions, whether that's private cloud or public cloud, it's all changing the way they work. Along with mobility, uh, although security is classed as a mega trend, I, I kind of disagree because security is around everything. Um, and we have a model where we show security as the roof of the house because Everything you want to do as an organization, whether you're in the public sector or private sector, needs security. 
and that's how we need to look at it. But this gives you a whole pressure pot of demands that we have to look at and cope with within security strategies. And just as an example of how you and I are driving this, this is uh, the latest reports for the retail market. Um, so by 2017, it's predicted that 60% of everything we buy globally will be on a mobile device or on the internet. That's a huge change. Um, Gartner even pushing it even harder and saying by 2016, $22 billion will be spent on NFC, NFC devices uh, per year. Now, we've still got check. We've still got checks, we've still got cash, we've still got debit cards, we've still got credit cards. No one's forcing us to use NFC, we're choosing to use NFC. So all of this is how we're driving it as consumers. Which is good and bad. Um, so if we look at it more in terms of security, and, and these are all things that you have to put together for your security strategy, because being a, a corporate strategic document, you have to look at the current trends, now, what's in the current market, where is it going, as well as everything that's related to the company itself. So this is based on some research that HP did, uh, or HP commissioned Ponemon uh, research to do this and collect this information. Uh, but first of all, I wanted to pick up the, uh, the top line, which was, uh, I'm sure you've all heard of the World Economic Forum that's held at Davos every year. So that's been going for well, about a decade now. And every year they look at the key corporate threats to the organizations, whether it's to governments or to, to commercial organizations. It was always financial markets, um, terrorist attacks, that type of thing. But two years ago, security suddenly popped onto their screen. It was within the top 20. It's now number three. So suddenly you have world leaders and world commercial company leaders thinking security is actually critical to the success of their business. Hence the reason why security strategies are so critical now. But just for uh, now some of the research that came out is the black market is currently considered to be worth $104 billion. Uh, and that's a huge amount of money and investment as to why they're willing to target your companies and why they want your personal data. And you now you can look at the internet on the news any single day of the week and you'll see a new attack. Now there's, there's been dozens in the last, just this year. And interesting now, the average fine for a compliance breach, whether it's loss of personal data or a hack or anything, is 270%, so nearly three times what they spend on security. So the average security spend is currently $5 million for an organization globally, no matter what the size. So they spend about 16 million on security and 5 million, sorry, 16 million on IT and 15 million on security, and then another 5 million on compliance but their fine could be three times that. And at the same time, we've got all the personal devices coming in. Uh, now, bring your own device is not necessarily a bad thing if it's handled properly. Now, some organizations like BP, for example, are really pushing this hard and are, are being very successful. But when you ask all employees, 43% of them say they're willing to send their personal data to the cloud or to their home device. So you've breached all your security straight away. And another 49%, and we're probably some of them, will turn off all the security on their devices. So whether it's a bring your own device or a complete personal device, you don't have any security with it anymore. And these are all trends that we need to consider as we go through things. But how do these threats relate to this strategy itself? So if we look at them in a bit more detail, these are the types of things that need to be in the opening of your security strategy. And the one that always gets quoted is the, the average cost of a data breach, which is currently $8.6 million for an average data, uh, data breach. But it's not actually that important because that's a what if. We don't really care. If, if we get asked, it's this is an insurance policy and we can't ever prove that number until it's happened. What's more interesting is where the things are happening. So for example, 44% of all data breaches are now happening in your third parties. So suddenly your security has moved from being within your perimeter to suddenly the entire supply chain. Uh, and you'll see organizations and it started with the financial markets and it's, it's going down through the different vertical sectors and now having to extend their security out and look at their third party suppliers. Have they got security in place? Do they comply with your supplier policies? Uh, do you have to audit them? Now, what's the risk of them having a breach? And that's a huge investment. I've got a client that I'm working with at the moment. It's a, it's a large bank. 
they've got 140 separate suppliers just for security and they want every single one audited every year well <laughs> yeah it, it would be great money I could I could employ everybody here and we could all do it and we could all be very rich but uh, <laughs> but I'm trying to persuade them actually not that's not the right strategy we actually need a risk-based approach in this and we need to consider who we're going to audit every year the other great one though is there's always been this risk about reputational damage now if you have a hack and it gets in the press and let's face it it always gets in the press these days is there going to be damage to your brand and the research now shows that your brand if you have a financial uh, capitalization will lose a third if you have a major breach that gets into the press now that's a hell of an impact and a damn sight more than 8.6 million of the direct impact that you would be affected by uh, so these are the kind of numbers that you need when you're trying to justify to the business why you need to do these things. And you can see the average company is only spending 8% of their security. And I think that's quite a high number, to be honest, because uh, most companies I deal with aren't spending 8% of their revenue on security. It's probably more like 3 or 4%. Um, and we need to move to being a more proactive uh, security function. Reactive measures is still king. And we can't ever get ahead of the hackers and the, the, the cyber criminals as long as we're trying to be um, reactive. And if we think about this in terms that we do see every day, now these are some of the numbers you'll see in the press all the time. It takes 243 days to, to detect a breach. Okay, it's quite interesting, but if we're still being reactive, doesn't make a great deal of difference proactive yet yeah, then we, then we can start to bring that number down more interesting one is this one down in the bottom corner 94 percent of breaches are only detected when a third party comes and tells you now that's a massive number um, and kind of questions what your entire security department's doing in terms of monitoring and detection now, how come they only found six percent of all the breaches you had uh, that just doesn't make sense and a lot of that is caused by the fact that we have this focus on perimeter security and perimeter security doesn't really exist anymore now if you take the supply chain piece again now they're immediately breaking uh, the, the perimeter because most of them have access to some of your systems so trying to defend the perimeter trying to be impregnable doesn't work anymore and we need a whole new approach and that's part of what i'm trying to say today is in terms of this strategy so why can't enterprises keep up with things? Can't keep up with information risk? Well, there's some pretty obvious things there over on the left-hand side, legacy technology. The systems we have today weren't designed for cloud, they weren't designed for mobile, they weren't designed for social interaction. So you're trying to bolt extra security around them and that's always gonna be a problem. And it takes often the manufacturer who created the system for you originally to actually help you put that security around it. Talent shortage, uh, so it kind of links back to the previous um, presentation, but th th the security market for resources in the UK is incredibly hot. Now, as individuals, it's great. We can go out there and we can earn a hell of a lot of money. Um, but actually, you now when I'm trying to recruit for my consultancy team, it's really difficult trying to find people that are actually got the qualifications and the experience and I can afford to pay them because some of them are asking ridiculous amounts of money. Um, and then you've also got the new star of IT, which we're going to explain a bit about further. And also lack of visibility is something the boards constantly complain to us about. And this all links back to the lack of an end-to-end -end security strategy. Now that visibility is a key fundamental piece of that. Uh, and we'll look at that in the few, in the, uh, later on in the presentation as well. So there's, there's a bit of a conundrum which HP like to describe as to what are the, those key things in three main topics. One is the nature and the motivation of attacks. So we always used to think uh, that our key problems were, you know, if you were in the right market, a nation state attack, and we always thought it would be China or Russia or North Korea. Now, over the last couple of years, we now know it's just as likely to be our own governments as it is gonna be a foreign government. So suddenly, for big commercial organizations they're now having to protect against very detailed and very carefully constructed attacks uh, that they would never worry about before 
Also, we've now got the hacktivists and the activists. So now you've got Anonymous who will go after things for political reasons. You've got the environmental groups. You've got the, the Syrian groups. Now, there's lots of different groups all looking to attack companies. And it can be simply because you use a supplier from a particular company, a particular country, right through to you have direct links with those, uh, those particular areas. Regulatory pressures, so we've spoken about this briefly, now there's lots and lots of regulations coming through. Now, the PCI standards have constantly changed, and now we're on the third or fourth iteration now, and yet retail companies are constantly being breached. So is PCI working? It's questionable. Basel III is the latest of the financial regulations, again that's bringing in more and more security and more and more testing. Uh, and obviously there's the, uh, the old Sarbanes-Oxley, which is the notorious around the world and then you've got the transformation of enterprise IT uh, and these come back to your four mega trends you've got the mobility the big data the cloud and the security uh, and we'll look at those in, in a moment so if we have a look at the uh, the implications of the new star of IT so this is kind of where we've changed uh, we've moved from a mainframe market through the client server, through the internet, and now we're in the, the mobile, social, big data, cloud environment. And they reckon that by 2020, there'll be 35 zettabytes of data. That's, I can't even imagine what size that number is. It's, it's a, all I know is that you know, 10 years ago, as a consumer, you were kind of quite happy if you had a zip drive. <laughs> now you've got a two, two terabyte personal cloud at home. It's now the market has changed considerably. And in these last 60 seconds that we've been talking about it, 98,000 tweets have been sent. Uh, I had a look earlier to see how, point, how pointless they were today. Uh, trending today was uh, things Jesus never said. Um, so <laughs> At the same time, we had no, almost 700,000 Google searches. Some of those might have been you searching to see what a zip drive was. Um, and 168 million emails were sent. So there's a huge amount of data going out there. And that all drives the big data, the social, the mobile. They're all linked together completely. So this brings us to the new star of IT. We spent a long time at HP Security thinking about how can we describe what is the new style of IT. And this is what we came up with. So hopefully it will explain it to you. So the, the principle is the legacy systems were a system of record. They were designed to record data, to process data, to calculate data. That was it. They weren't designed to interact with users. They weren't designed to interact with mobile, with cloud or anything else. They were basic systems designed to do single purposes. Now though we have what's called we're calling a system of engagement. It's designed to engage with the user whether that's through social media, through mobile, through the cloud, but it's all about touching people, analyzing and providing objectives rather than single processing pieces. And this is the the fundamental thing that's affecting every organization globally currently. And it really is critical that people get to, get to grips with just what this means to your environment because it changes your world completely. So I'm going to try to explain what new style of IT means and why is it got to such an impact. So it's going to get a little bit theoretical for a couple of slides, but hopefully it will make sense. So in 1997, Harvard Business Review proposed that since the invention of the printing press, there was a universal trade-off between the customization of, the, of uh, an interaction against the reach. Okay? So as consultants, we like to get everything down to a two dimension. Uh, we like to make it really simple and then it looks like we're in our money. Um, so in its, in its simplest form is a face-to-face -face conversation. So if I'm having a one-to-one -one conversation, I can look at you, I can see how you're reacting, what you're asking, and I can adjust the conversation against it. That is as rich and as customized as I can get, but the, re the reach is absolutely minimum. You move to a group like this, and then the customization level starts to fall away slightly because I can't change it for each and one of you. And as you go down to you get to the end with something like TV, there's no customization, but the reach is massive. And this is a universal truth, effectively, that's existed since the printing press, 
and has never changed. Now, when radio came out, still applied. When TV came out, it still applied. Satellite TV still applies. There's lots of channels, but there's still no customization. Um, and we needed to understand how this was changed by the new style of IT. And basically, it breaks it completely. This is the new style of IT up here. Um, it completely breaks the model for the first time. It's what's called creative destruction. Um, so suddenly you can have a very rich conversation because of social media or analytics. I can constantly change everything that I give to you all, but I can do it to everybody on the planet if necessary, if I've got enough processing power to do it. So suddenly the reach is very high and the customization is very high. And that's what we have with you know, people interaction with social media, data interaction and system interaction. So it's, it's a whole new change. And that's driven the, the whole piece of social media and the value of networks. Now there was a, a law called Metcalfe's law that says the value of a network is worth the square of the number of nodes in the network. And in this case, a node is you and I. Um, and that played out with WhatsApp. Now, Facebook bought them for $19 billion. And the only reason was the theoretical value of that network because of the number of users in it. And at the time, they had 450 million users and they were gaining about a million users a day. So somebody got their checkbook out and paid $19 billion for that. It doesn't exist in reality. It's just a theoretical thing. But that is the power of the new style of IT, that you can give them a network that allows them to engage with that many people. And that changes completely the way we have to operate. So hopefully that kind of explains why the new style of IT is so important. But just as important for us is, well, what's this actually mean for security? What's the flip side of this? Well, it's the fact there's a dark side to this. There's always a dark side. I'm in security, I always think there's a negative. Um, so this is the same model now, but looking from a security perspective. So in the old days, to have a, a highly rich and a low reach conversation, it was a phone call social engineering. And I'd literally phone you up and try and question you to get information out of you. On the other end, we had phishing. Uh, I would just send a very badly worded email to everybody on the planet, if I could get your email address, saying that no, there was some money for you in Nigeria and now send me, your, send me your bank details. The new star of IT version is spear phishing. So suddenly I can send an email again to lots of people, but every single email has been customized and crafted from what I know about you from social media, from the press. Now, and generally these are targeted against senior individuals. They might be the CEOs or chief officers of companies, um, but I can attack a huge amount of companies at the same time. And the same logic applies to APTs, botnets. Now, it all uses this technology to deliver these things. So it's a whole new way of working, and this is what you need to account for in your strategies. And that links into the, uh, the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. Now, this is a simplified version, but the reason I put it up was really to justify the fact that the research and the infiltration is critical now. Now that's where everything happens. And that's why we have to move away from that perimeter protection to actually looking at the in internal systems. It's all about monitoring internally rather than worrying about the, the uh, perimeter. So how do we actually use security as a business enabler? It's the fundamentals of it. If we want to impress our bosses, we want to do, be successful, we have to work out how to stop security just being a problem, a delayer. How can we actually make it valuable to the company? The first thing is leadership. Traditionally, uh, security managers were the typical. Now, five years ago, the most senior person would be a security manager. All they were in interested in was security controls. Now they'd take 27,001, they'd apply it, um, they wouldn't even interpret it, it would be almost to the letter, and that would be what they delivered. Currently, we have more information security leaders, so they're more interested in information security risk and IT operations and compliance. So we, we've stepped up a level, um, but where we're heading to is the business risk leader. We're just starting to see them emerge within, within large organizations. 
but this is where you get a true CISO. Now they can actually sit on the board and have a true business conversation. Uh, and they're not going to talk techie, they're going to talk about how can we use real concepts to deliver value. And this is ultimately what they're trying to do. They have to ba uh, balance opportunity with security risk. And it's not as simple as security risk has to be too low. It's, it's, in the old days, we would say, now you, you, you had a particular level of business risk you were willing to accept and you could never go above it. And that was it. No questions. Now it changes on every single decision. And it's constantly trying to balance these things to work out quite where we want to be. And it has to be the right type of leadership to deliver this thing. Um, you often hear the, um, the metaphor of security of the brakes on a car. Now, have you heard that one before? So we can keep the car from going too fast and we can make sure you don't do anything stupid by slowing you down. Okay, that's fine, that used to work. But no, we, went, we talked at the beginning about the fact that we need to actually help them be innovative and com compete as quickly as possible. So we now need to think about it in completely the opposite way. By being the brakes on the car, we can actually help them to go faster because we know we can apply the safety net of slowing them down when there's a problem. But ultimately, 99% of the time, we can actually go faster than we used to be able to go because we have that protection around us. It's a bit like... Um, I completely forgot the word. <laughs> it's a bit like having the... Uh, the protection of a of the uh, the airbag in a car because no we can fire it if we need to slow it down uh, but in general we can actually go safer and faster than we could with a, a model 4t now we, we can move on from there the second part of it is looking at using security as a business enabler so how can we actually use the technology and this is just one example of things that companies are starting to look at so now we've all been to core call centers and after we've explained who we are and then we've been transferred to someone else and we've told them and then we've been transferred to someone else and told them they then want to ask us every security question on the planet now everything from you know, what GCSEs did you do at school to what transaction did you make on the 5th of March at 2 a.m. in the morning um, it's really difficult for clients now for customers to actually use this stuff we're not helping them but there's technology out there to use it now we can make life so much easier for them by using something like identity federation now everybody now well, not everybody but it's getting there most people have at least one social media type account and if you look at the stats Lots of companies are starting to use Facebook authentication, Twitter authentication, Google authentication. There's lots of choices out there, but they actually provide much more of a single point of authentication than even the government can provide us with. So why can't we use social media to do this type of thing? No. I'm at the airport, I missed my flight. So I send a tweet to the airline saying, I've just missed my flight. Um, what do I do? Uh, if they know, if they've already federated my authentication, so they know who I am from my Twitter account, they're able to pull that information up and take whatever action they want. I'm not sure most airlines would book me another flight within 40 minutes, but it would be nice. <laughs> and the same with uh, companies in terms of you know, um, loyalty points, that type of thing. And some companies are already starting to use these things, um, but it's still quite early days out there. But we can make life a lot simpler, and this is a, a simple example of how we can use security to enable the business. Because we can process the transactions faster, and we can make the customer's life a lot happier. So hopefully I'm not too over my time. Um, so I want to kind of pull this all together now in terms of standards and what that means to us. Now this is going to be slightly contentious for some of you, because I'm going to suggest that 27,001 has had its day. Okay? So 27,001 is for, uh, 19 years old. It was refreshed in 2013, but it didn't really, it was, it was a makeover. It didn't have any structural changes. And 27,001 ultimately has this approach. It asks you to assume that your systems are impregnable. 
Now, even the NSA can't stop us hacking into them, so the chances of us having an impregnable system is pretty damn slim. The messaging is all around fear and doubt and uncertainty. It's, it's how can we frighten you with security rather than how can we use security to help you. And everything is based around the IT and the risk department, not about the business. So everything about this approach, although it makes sense within certain areas within a business, I'm, it's not, I'm not suggesting that 27001 should be thrown away completely, but it needs to be within self-contained areas. Much more sensible approach, and this is just one example, is the NIST cybersecurity framework. So this has completely turned everything around. It now says the very first thing you do is identify your assets. And you then choose which assets you want to protect and how much you want to protect them. So your budget requirements have suddenly changed completely because rather than trying to make this impregnable perimeter, we're saying, well, I've got 20% of my data here that I really, really have to protect. I've got a piece over here that I now want to protect pretty well. And the rest of it, I'm not quite so worried about. And it also talks about respond. Now, if you look at uh, 27001, identify your assets was A8, instant management was A16. Now I know technically these aren't in order, now, they're, they're sections of 27001, but the reality is it does imply that they are very low on the importance scale. Whereas NIST and others out there are making it a lot more and they've, they've turned the whole system around. So this gives us a whole new approach and this is kind of my key slide so if you remember nothing else that i said today remember this with the new style of it you have to assume a state of compromise every single company is either compromised today or will be compromised tomorrow it's guaranteed it doesn't matter who you are um, you have to stop thinking about the perimeter you have to start thinking about detection throughout the estate our messaging hasn't quite lined up on this screen, unfortunately, but it's um, the messaging is around providing confidence and visibility and how can security help you. Accountability is now the board and the CEO. It's not the IT manager or even the IT director that's responsible for this stuff. It's the board. And that goes back to the World Economic Forum where the CEOs are taking responsibility for things. And we need to have that risk-based focus that includes the value chain. So that's all your suppliers, your, your end delivery logistics, now depending on your business, the different types of value chain that you have. And ultimately we have to be lean and agile and allow the company to deliver everything it needs to and compete in the way it needs to. So finally, just while we're at the university, I just want to kind of have a quick advert. Um, HP has a, a very big graduate and uh, internship program. Um, so for anyone who's related to that in any way, now there's lots of opportunities there in every stream, but for my interest, there's uh, lots of focus on cybersecurity recruitment at the moment. Um, so there are lots of opportunities there. So have a look on the website. Um, that's it.